Okay, hi, IB students. So I'm doing the revision video today. It's gonna to be on genetics. So I'm gonna go through the first part is gonna be the standard level material. Um, and then I'm gonna say, okay, SLs, you can stop. And then I'm gonna go into the first two thirds of topic 10. So topic 10 is HL material, but related to genetics and evolution. So rather than doing it separately, I'm just going to do it as a part of those two topics. Um, so the last kind of third of this video will be the HL material related to genetics. So I'll flag when that's beginning. Uh, so this is topic three plus some topic 10 all together. Okay, so I wanna start kind of doing a little bit of an overview in terms of terminology. This should be pretty easy stuff, but having your words correct and how it relates to one another is really important. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a a uh, detailed central dogma kind of concept. So essentially DNA, of course, is our genetic material. DNA is then organized in eukaryotes particularly, we'll talk about the prokaryotes, into what we call chromosomes, which is basically units of DNA. So um, I come use the analogy a lot of a cookbook. So we're looking at the idea that DNA is all the instructions. Uh, chromosomes are individual cookbooks with sets of instructions. Each recipe is then one instruction to make one thing. So in this terminology, that would be one gene. And then just again, hitting the central dogma, where does that relate? So we understand that one gene makes one protein and proteins are what give us our physical traits. So our protein is what determines our trait. So when we're looking at Mendel, kind of the emphasis was very much on the phenotype. Um, so if we kind of were to add those words in, we would say what genes you have is kind of your genotype, what is your genetic information, and then that gives rise to the trait, which is the phenotype, but just actually understanding that kind of the in-between there is the reason why genotype influences phenotype is because genotype determines what protein is made and which protein is made is what actually determines the trait. Okay, we're gonna fill in a few more things into this uh, in terms of some terminology. So for instance, all the DNA that an organism has Kind of the total collection of it would be called their genome. And so I said that for all DNA because when they actually did the Human Genome Project, one of the big findings of it is that there's a lot of DNA that doesn't seem to directly code for proteins. So we drew this kind of diagram, but there is DNA that doesn't fall into this category. Um, so all of the DNA is the genome. Uh, something you need to know a little bit about is the Human Genome Project, which was essentially the mapping of all genes. And also along with that, the discovery that there was a lot of DNA that did not seem to be coding. So it kind of mapped approximately 23,000 genes. And the discovery of lots of non-coding information. And remember, initially that was kind of called a junk DNA, but we understand now that it probably does play important roles in gene regulation. So does that include things like promoters um, and things that are introns, things that we understand to be kind of part of the process, whether it's through alternate splicing and so forth. Um, so we understand there probably are roles for that. So just like it's kind of making some connections. We're gonna go more into genetics, but this is a good time to remind HLs uh, to kind of go back over your topic seven and make sure you're good on kind of DNA transcription translation. Um, in terms of how they actually did the Human Genome Project was with something called the Sanger Method. I don't think I would worry too much about it for HLs. Uh, SLs, it was actually in your course in Topic 7, so you will need to kind of look back at that in that uh, context, but that was where they basically used the fluoro-labeled um, 
nucleotides whereby it would stop kind of it would use the nucleotides that caused the termination and then it would be labeled so essentially if it stopped at this position it was yellow which means that a was right there and that was how they did it for the sake of getting through these videos i'm going to do a few times where i just remind you of things um, especially if i don't think it's likely to be a super important thing on an sl level uh hls you may want to kind of just read back over that process um, and one suggestion i had to my students was even maybe make some flashcards of these kind of standalone little things. Uh, so that might be one where you want to make a flashcard for the human genome and Sanger method, just as a quick reminder of that. Okay, if we keep moving along and adding a little bit more information. So when we talk chromosomes, key difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So when we talk prokaryotes, we know that they have one circular naked chromosome. What we mean by naked is just not contained within any sort of nucleus. So it's found in the cytoplasm. And the other thing that's unique about prokaryotes is that they also have plasmids, which are the additional rings of DNA um, that can also be independently replicating and be passed along, uh, which is a tool for kind of spreading antibiotic resistance, that bacteria can have plasmids that have resistant genes on them and pass them kind of within a colony. Uh, so plasmids are an interesting kind of extra thing. We are gonna talk about them a little bit more when we do the biotech in this video, so we'll come back to that then. Uh, eukaryotes, on the other hand, we have many linear chromosomes. And they are actually not kind of naked, but they are actually wrapped around proteins called histones. Again, HL, those are called nucleosomes. Um, so you will need to know that term. Uh, and a little bit more detail, but just at an SL level, how tightly they wrap around is an important thing. So essentially when they wrap around it, they can uncoil for gene expression. So when we actually want to use the DNA, it does need to kind of lighten around the histone. And then they can super coil for mitosis. So essentially, they can kind of condense into highly visible chromosomes uh, when they're in the kind of less tight form. We often refer to that as chromatin, which is just the looser kind of material where the genes are wrapped around the histones, but not curled quite as tightly, and it's more usable, easier to access for gene expression. So as we go, I'm just kind of reminding you of a few things, not necessarily writing them down, um, but that are come up in kind of different areas as well. In terms of how do we know this, so how do we realize that this is one chromosome, whereas these are many chromosomes? So this is another where I would say maybe a little flashcard thing to remind you of an application or a NOS point, which is the Cairns technique. And he used autoradiography to actually visually get images of chromosomes and he started with E. coli. So his work was actually with E. coli and the discovery of that single looped circular chromosome. Um, but then that same technique was then used with eukaryotes to identify that it was not circular but rather distinct lines. Um, and then that same technique can be used to check the length and then kind of the overall size of different organisms' genomes based on kind of chromosome length and so forth. So that's a, another little bits and piece to be aware of. Um, so again, we're just kind of adding a little bit of information terminology we need to begin with. So when we talk genes, this is a good time to clarify that essentially we know that there's variation between organisms. I, we do not all have the same trait. The reason why we don't all have the same trait is because we don't all have the same genotype because there are different versions of genes. So the different versions of a gene is called the allele. So an allele is the version of a gene. And so your genotype is essentially which two alleles does the individual have? 
So your genotype is what combination of alleles do you get from your parents? Um, and then that's gonna determine your trait. One little note here is that the number of genes that a species have does not appear to be related to its complexity. So there are organisms that have more genes than us that are evolutionarily believed to be simpler organisms. Uh, certainly kind of even clearly from my looking at them, they have less kind of uh, functional capacity than humans and yet they have more genes. So that's one thing we want to be careful of is to be aware that there's not a correlation uh, in that and same with chromosome numbers. So certainly there seems to be a sense whereby simpler organisms often have fewer chromosomes, but for instance, dogs have way more chromosomes than we do, probably twice as many, yet dogs are not twice as complex as us. So there's not a direct combination between either chromosome number or gene number and complexity, uh, which is worth kind of recognizing. So next thing we're gonna talk a little bit about is how do these different alleles come about? Two more things before that that I wanna add on here. Uh, so all genes have a specific kind of address on a chromosome. So it'd be kind of like, again, if you had a cookbook, you'd be able to know that this cookbook always has the recipe for lemon slice on page 33. So that's where that recipe fits into the cookbook. So same idea here, all genes have a specific location. So which chromosome are they found on and in which position? And the name for that is the loci, if it's a single one or, or sorry, multiple ones, or locus. So locus or loci is like a gene's address on the chromosome. So what chromosome does it belong to? Uh, and then again, just a reminder that this process here, whereby the gene becomes the protein, is transcription and translation. And everybody does need to know that. That's topic two for SLs. And then, of course, lots more detail on that in topic at seven for HLs. Um, so there's the process whereby that gene does actually become the trait. The other little small point that we'll put kind of here, just for somewhere to have it, um, is that the environment does play a role in that. So we have our gene, and then for it to become the trait, the gene has to be expressed. And then based on how the gene is expressed, that gives rise to the trait. So just having a genotype doesn't necessarily guarantee a set phenotype because there are factors that can play a role here, which include the environment. So the environment can determine whether or not the gene is expressed or kind of internal regulators as well. So things that turn gene expression on or off. And so that kind of process uh, where we look at kind of how are the genes expressed, essentially the pattern of gene expression is called epigenetics. So genetics would just be like your genome, would just be all the DNA, all your genes. If we wanna look more at the pattern, really at that relationship between genotype and phenotype. So how are genes expressed in organisms and what gives rise to phenotype? That would be the area of epigenetics. So that's just kind of another definition for you um, to talk about. So, like I said, I want to talk a little bit more about alleles and in particular what causes them. So different variations are caused by changes in the DNA. So if DNA gives you your genes, then if your DNA is different, your gene is different, therefore your alleles are different. So these are specifically caused by mutations. So we're gonna do a little quick thing on mutations now. Um, and so we'll talk mutations quickly, um, and then we'll move on to meiosis. I'm just gonna erase a little bit. It's just a small little point, but I wanna have enough room to do it properly. So mutations is a fairly big area. Uh, and your course doesn't go into tons of detail about it here. So you need to know kind of two 
categories, but really only need to know a lot of information about one. Um, but essentially, mutations can fall. And so when we say mutations real quickly, we're talking about gene mutations. And so what I mean by that is it's a change at a single gene, not at like a whole chromosome level. So if a part of a chromosome breaks off, that would be a mutation as well, but that would be like a chromosomal mutation. Uh, and those are much more rare. So when we talk about mutations here, we're saying like there's an error in a single gene only. And these can fall into two main categories, which is point or frame shift. And your emphasis is really only on point mutations. So just mentioning that as a distinguishing feature. But point mutations have the same number of bases. One of them just got changed. So there's a same amount of information. There's just one T became a C, if you will. A frame shift mutation actually is an insertion or deletion of a base. So it changes the number. And those are gonna be more serious because it alters the reading frame because we read bases and triplets. If you do that, if you change the number, you change how every single codon is read. So these are generally gonna be more severe in their impact because of changing the reading frame. What you need to know about is point mutations. So point mutations, if they change one base, the consequence of that is one little set of three is changed. And this is coming to a little bit of transcription language. So one codon is changed. So the change in one codon is going to have an impact potentially on the actual protein that's made. So this is really just a very much a side point within genetics. Uh, mutations, if anything, are really more of a gene expression, transcription, translation issue. Um, but where our emphasis is on is making sure we understand how mutations relate to alleles. So when a mutation changes the protein, it changes a trait and therefore it introduces a new allele. Um, the three categories of point mutations, they um, are possible is a silent point mutation, a missense, and then a nonsense. So silent mutations, they change the codon, but it change codes for the same amino acid. These are really important to understand um, as we go into evolution as well and look at the idea that we just need to remember that not all mutations give rise to evolution because not all mutations create new alleles. So this, in this case, there would be no new allele because we don't lead to any difference in the protein made. A missense is one codon is changed, therefore one amino acid changes. And these are really common so this would give rise to a new allele. And because there's only that one change, a lot of times the protein is still made and may even be marginally functional. Therefore, this new allele concept is really common as a result of missense mutations. Nonsense mutations are more serious because they introduce a premature stop. So it changes a normal codon to a stop codon. And so these are generally going to be quite severe, whereby a lot of times they create a non-functional protein. Uh, so generally more serious in that context. For missense, there is one that you need to know, and that is sickle cell anemia. And so again, as we go through this, I'm going to mention a few disorders. It's a bit tricky because there was a past test where they're like, eight points. Tell me about the cause and treatment and all of that of sickle cell anemia. So this is a good thing. Like if you have time, I wouldn't necessarily prioritize it because most likely if you're asked about sickle cell anemia, it's going to be a one or two mark question, a multiple choice, or uh, give an example of how it give, is uh, related to either codominance or to a uh, missense mutation. So unlikely you're going to have to write eight points about it. But if you get to 
to November and you're like, I am so studied up, I need something else to do, go back through your disorders and make a card on each one and say, okay, here's a card on sickle cell anemia. What's the cause? What's the symptoms? What's the treatment? Uh, where did it come up in the course? So that's a suggestion for not a high priority study thing, but certainly something that could be added, which would be good. Uh, so sickle cell anemia is actually caused by a missense mutation in the sixth codon, so sixth set of three bases, uh, and it changes a, I'm going to make sure I write it right, a CTC to a CAC, which of course we have to, if we want to look at how that affects the amino acids, you would have to turn, turn it into uh, mRNA, so it changes from what would have been a GAG into a GUG, GAG codes for glutamic acid, whereas GUG codes for valine. So again, here's an example where it's caused by a single amino acid change. That change changes uh, the structure of hemoglobin and how it, how it kind of attaches onto the red blood cell. It causes that low oxygenation for the uh, hemoglobin to kind of cluster and cause a sickling in shape of the red blood cell, which makes it less effective at carrying oxygen. So that's a very short version of it. Like I said, most likely you would just be asked, do you know it's an example of a missense mutation? Uh, but something to read up a bit more about if you want to kind of be prepared to go into a bit more information on it. Okay, so now we're gonna, I'm gonna pause this one, erase, and then we're going to uh, move into chromosomes and meiosis. Okay, so next thing we need to do is be clear on meiosis um, because meiosis kind of underpins uh, all of inheritance because we need to understand essentially the idea of gametes and then we only pass on one copy um, and how we go about that because that will guide our understanding of inheritance. Meiosis is a little bit all over the place in your course and that we're gonna do a pretty good intro introduction to it now with, H with SL. Then after at the end of this video, I'm gonna go back into a couple more things with HL only because uh, you guys need to know a little bit more about crossing over um, and a little bit more about linking independent assortment to metaphase and so forth. Um, and then also a reminder, HLs, that then um, in topic 11, when you look at sexual reproduction, the stuff on spermato uh, spermatogenesis and oogenesis is picking back up a bit with meiosis uh, and adding some names to the cells at each type. So kind of revisit that. So kind of a couple of different places that it turns up. Um, before we go too far into the stages of meiosis, we need to have a little bit of a chat more about chromosomes. So when we talk chromosomes, what we need to know is that each chromosome is unique in terms of several factors. So it's unique in its length. It's unique in its banding pattern, which is essentially related to kind of um, genes versus filler DNA or junk DNA. So we tend to see a darkening where there's a cluster of genes and then there's kind of spacer material in between. Uh, and so that's what creates the banding pattern. And then they're unique in terms of the actual position of the centromere. So you do need to know, and I'm sure all of you do, uh, that in humans we have 23 pairs. Um, but we want to be careful, sometimes in the mark schemes they'll penalize you if you always use 23 and 46 rather than using terms like haploid and diploid. Uh, so just being aware that that is only our unique chromosome number. So for humans we have 23 unique chromosomes. But those chromosomes exist in pairs, but for each one, we actually have two. So, but we have two for each. And so the two, one from mom and one from dad. So this idea of homologous chromosomes is going to be really important for understanding meiosis. It's not super important in mitosis because homologous chromosomes just don't really have anything to do with each other. Uh, but as we go into mitosis, or meiosis, sorry, if you have to be crystal clear on homologous chromosomes versus sister chromatids. So I just want to make sure we're good on that first. 
So these idea of two for each are called homologous chromosomes. And so they are going to have the same of all of this. So they are going to have the same length. So it would be the exact same length. Let's say I had bands here, 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 and here's my centromere. Then if we were to look at the other copy of it, it would be the same length, it would be the same banding pattern, same centromere position. So those are my homologous chromosomes. They have the same banding pattern because they have the exact same genes on them, but they don't have the same genes, the same alleles. So your parents are not identical to each other. So for instance, this might be the blood type gene and your dad has the alleles for type O. So he has a little i allele, whereas your mom has the allele for type A. So same gene, blood type is in the exact same place, but they do have different alleles because they came from different individuals. The way I've drawn it there, they are as single chromatids. We generally don't use the term chromatid unless we're talking about them in the uh, position where they're actually been doubled. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that in our next kind of thing along. Um, of the 22, 23 pairs, 22 are autosomes. And that just means gender has no impact on, they're not related to gender at all. And the 23rd pair determines sex, so determines biological sex. And in particular, it is the Y that determines it. So XX is female. And female is actually the default. So in absence of a Y, all embryos will develop into a female. But Y has on it the SRY gene which codes for the testes determining factor, which creates male embryos. So if the Y is present, then that gene will be expressed, which will turn on the development of testes and the embryo will no longer be female. So presence of a Y is what determines that. Okay, so let's do a quick overview of meiosis in terms of chromosome number. Then we'll go into a little bit on the individual stages. I'm not going to draw out each stage because if I were to do that, I would end up spending like an hour on meiosis. Um, and we're trying to review things relatively quickly. So go back over if you need to, but I'll kind of go through the high points anyway. Uh, in terms of how meiosis was discovered, just a little NOS point is to remember that it was discovered using um, tissue from the ovaries of rabbits. So that's kind of our background history of that. Okay, so when we start meiosis, we start with a germ cell. And this is where, again, if you're HL, you should be able to basically go through and add into this your correct terms. So um, are we looking at a spermato, yeah, spermatogamogonium versus a eugonium? So you know the terms for these for males and females. Uh, SLs, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, so we have our germ cell. Then my germ cell, before anything else happens, it's going to go through a round of DNA replication. So remember DNA replication in the cell cycle is the S phase, so that's where that S comes from. So it's going to go through DNA replication. Uh, so it is now going to be still a germ cell, but it is now a germ cell with sister chromatids. That does not change the chromosome number. So when it is a germ cell, it is diploid. Oh, sorry, yes, I wanted to mention that. So any cell that has homologous chromosomes is called a diploid cell. Make sure you can still see that, yes. So if it has homologous chromosomes, that is a diploid cell, and that is pretty much all of our cells except sex cells. If it does not have homologous chromosomes, if it has only one of each, and the only case in which that is, happens is for reproduction, 
then we call those haploids. Hopefully you remember those terms, but we are gonna start using them now. So just wanna be clear on that. So my germ cell is always a diploid cell, and we write that as 2N. So in the case of humans, that 2N is 46. Again, if you're writing about it from a spermatogenesis or a genesis, we are implying humans in that case, because it's human physiology, so you can use those numbers. Um, but just be aware, if you're writing it more broadly, you can just say it's a diploid cell. Goes through DNA replication. So I'm gonna kind of draw my little guys over there. So this is what it looked like before. After DNA replication, I now have two identical copies of each and they're connected at the centromere. So the centromere is holding them together. Each of those is now a sister chromatid set. So those are sister chromatids, those are sister chromatids. As a general group, they're still homologous chromosomes. So the pink and the blue are homologous chromosomes, but in this case, they also have sister chromatids. We still say that this cell is 2N, and if it's human, it is still 46. So there's a whole Amoeba Sisters video on that if you want to go back and watch that. Um, but the short version is we count chromosomes by centromeres or by unique pieces of genetic information. So we do not double the chromosome number because of DNA replication. So this is still 46 chromosomes. It does, however, have 92 chromatids. So it has double chromatids right now. Um, but no more unique information, so it's still 46. From there, that cell goes through meiosis one. So it is now going to go in through meiosis one. And I'm gonna write this from a couple different places because it's crucial. Meiosis one separates homologous chromosomes. And we're gonna do meiosis one in a second. Meiosis 1 is more interesting than meiosis 2, so we'll spend a little bit longer on it. So in meiosis 1, I'm going to go ahead and separate the mom's version from the dad's version. At the end of meiosis 1, I now have a haploid germ cell. So it was still, it was diploid, I'm going to add that here. So I'm sure you love it when I add things and you didn't leave space for it. Uh, so it is now a haploid germ cell. So for instance, now it would only have the one version. And as we revise just my own little perfectionist of not wanting to do anything inaccurate, I am gonna do that to indicate crossing over has already occurred. We'll talk about crossing over in a second. So this cell is now in, or it would only have 23 pairs of chromosomes. However, you'll notice they're still attached by the centromere, so it has 46 chromatids. Okay, and then because it still has the chromatids, it needs to go through another round of division. This stage here is where the actual chromosome reduction occurs. So chromosome reduction is key, and it actually occurs in meiosis one, that's where I went from kind of 46 to 23. Meiosis two is basically just mitosis. So now I'm going to separate out those sister chromatids. The sister chromatids were important because they allowed crossing over to happen, which we'll talk about next, which allows for genetic diversity. So it's important to replicate and then divide, um, but we now need to separate them out or otherwise I have too many chromatids. So now I'm gonna have meiosis two, and at the end of meiosis two, I am now going to separate the sister chromatids. And so now I have a haploid gamete. So again, HLs, you have like a spermatotid and it will now need to go through differentiation to become a true sperm. So you know that there's a, sometimes an extra step whereby I have the gamete, but it's still not differentiated. Uh, and you know that in 
women, it's even more complicated because it actually pauses and arrests and all of that. So HLs, I like to just remind you how bad it is. Um, so you can remember to go back over that. SLs, just learn this, it's all good. Okay, so now this is N is 23, and this is just the 23 chromatids as well. So by this time, it has just the one copy. So now one single chromosome and only one copy. Okay, so that is all really good. So just a quick note of kind of the why we do this. The reason why we do it is because the gametes can then join together during fertilization. So down the road, we could have gamete plus gamete and that give rise to a zygote. And so it's important that these are both haploid. So we have N plus N equals 2N. So it's essential that we create haploid gametes so that we can create diploid zygote. Haploid gametes give rise to diploid zygotes. And then of course the name of that process is fertilization. So in theory, that's kind of the, almost the point. So we don't just end with haploid gametes. The point of them is for them to then join with another gamete to create zygotes. So that's kind of now I'm back to a two in. So you start with a diploid germ cell, go through all of this and you create new offspring that are also diploids. So that's kind of the purpose behind it. A couple places where genetic diversity is really important. Um, so during fertilization, this is a process that increases genetic diversity because all of the gametes are unique. So each of my haploid gametes is a genetically unique organ uh, cell. Uh, and that happens as a result of some things that go on, particularly in meiosis one. And we'll go into meiosis one now. So we'll talk a little bit about that there uh, in terms of how that happens. So like I said, I wanna go over a couple of key events in meiosis one, quickly go over meiosis two, um, and then I'm just gonna draw my metaphase one and metaphase two, uh, so that you can distinguish between them. Those are the probably most important two stages. Uh, if you have to know what those look like, you can kind of work out the rest. So I know instead of drawing all of it, um, and then we'll move on to some Mendelian stuff. And then, like I said, when we get to HL material, we'll go into more detail on crossing over. Uh, but we do need to know it occurs at a standard level as well. So let's kind of finish that off. Another thing that is good to do if you're looking at kind of uh, exam prep would be to kind of go through a mitosis versus meiosis comparison chart. So it's a really common thing to show up in uh, paper two. So kind of set it up as, okay, what kind of cells are made? Diploid versus haploid, somatic cells versus gametes, uh, number of chromosomes, are they genetically unique? Things like that. Um, so that's just an, uh, a suggestion uh, is that once you've kind of studied this again on meiosis, to kind of go back and summarize meiosis by comparing it to mitosis, because that is something you could be very likely to see uh, on the exam. Okay, so meiosis one versus meiosis two. So everything that's interesting happens in meiosis one. Meiosis two is just a, basically a round of mitosis. So, and I'm gonna write this again because that's how important it is. So the goal of meiosis one is gonna be to separate homologous chromosomes. And my stages are gonna be the same stages as mitosis. So I'm gonna have prophase one, followed by metaphase one, followed by anaphase one, 
followed by telephase one. Okay, what I want to talk about is prophase one. So in mitosis, homologous chromosomes do not ever have to join together. So your mom's chromosome three is doing its own thing, living its best life, dad's chromosome three is doing its own thing, they don't need to hang out. In meiosis, they have to come together. So that's really the key, is that that's what makes this unique. So in prophase one, your homologous chromosomes come together. And there's a couple of like just terminology things you need to know. Uh, so you, they basically come together to form bivalence, which is I guess a fun um, IV term. I've always used tetrads, but bivalence just means bi is two, the two homologous chromosomes joining together. Um, so they form the bivalent or the tetrad. If you see that tetrad being four, just different ways of saying the same thing. The actual process of them joining together is called synapsis. So the joining together, the fancy name for that is synapsis. So homologous chromosomes join together to form bivalence, and then while they have joined together, crossing over occurs. So crossing over occurs in prophase one. So you do need to know kind of where that occurs. Crossing over is the exchange of genetic material between homologous chromosomes. So being careful with that. Sister chromatids exchanging genetic material would not accomplish anything because they are identical. So it's one chromatid from moms with one chromatid from dads exchanging genetic information. So it's going to be exchange of genes between homologous chromosomes. At standard level, that's all you need to know about it. You need to know that they come together and that they exchange genetic information. And you need to know the significance of that is that it's going to increase our genetic variation. So that's going to be really important. Uh, so by switching that, it means the sister chromatids are no longer identical to one another. So we're creating more genetic variation, which is significant. You don't necessarily need to know kind of the rest. Um, you could potentially have to draw a picture of it. So if you were to draw a picture of it, you would want to show here's sister chromatids from dad's copy. Here's sister chromatids from mom's copy. They overlap on top of each other. I think drawing it might only actually be HL, but anyway, it wouldn't hurt. The little point where they overlap is the chiasma. And then now we should see that we have this copy here that has still all of dad's information, but the sister chromatid now has some new information on it. And then if we come over here, this one again has some recombined information down here, and this one here looks the same. Okay, so that's crossing over, uh, that that's happening in prophase one. In metaphase one, what's important is that the bivalents line up together. So they line up in pairs next to each other at the metaphase plate. So chromosomes line up in pairs, And the ordering of the pair is random. So in other words, it doesn't go mom's dad, mom's dad's, mom's dad's, mom's dad's. It might go mom's dad's, dad's mom's, mom's dad's, dad's mom's. So they can flip around a bit at random. There's more on that in um, HL, so we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. All you would necessarily need to for HL is that there is a random orientation, which just means which one is on which side of the middle of the pairs or the bivalence. 
So that's just referring to the fact that it could be, so like let's say this is mom's dad's because I'm being gendered and using pink for mom and blue for dad's, sorry. So this is chromosome pair one, this is chromosome pair two. So it could look like this where their mom's is on each side, dad's is on each side, which means when they split, this one gets both mom's copies, this one gets both dad copies. But 50% of the time it flips and they line up like this in which case now when they split, this has a mom's copy, a dad's copy, this has a mom's copy, a dad's copy. That's gonna be important in HL, so we'll draw that then. Okay, so then anaphase, of course, is just separation. So this is where the actual separation occurs. So my spindle fibers pull apart the pairs. And just a reminder that telophase is related to the reformation of nuclei. And that happens in telophase. Okay, then there is no DNA replication in between. So no S phase, no DNA replication between meiosis one and meiosis two. So we're gonna go straight from telophase one into meiosis two. And meiosis two is going to go through the same events. So it's going to go through prophase two, followed by metaphase two, followed by anaphase two, followed by telophase two. And the goal of all of that is to separate the sister chromatids. And so just remembering that of course at the very end, telophase two is going to be followed by cytokinesis two to actually separate the cells um, because meios the stages up through telophase is only separating the nuclei. And then again, in terms of our end result, by the end of this, we should have four genetically unique. And when you say genetically unique, particularly if you were writing on an ERQ and you wanted to get extra points, they're genetically unique to each other and from the parent. And again, why comes back to this and also this random orientation of bivalence this is also going to increase variation. So both of those two things are gonna increase variation. And they are four genetically unique haploid gametes. So even if you just think in terms of how would you compare it to mitosis on a question, this is kind of your answer. So point one, four, not two. Point two, genetically unique from each other and from parent in mitosis, they are identical to each other and to the parent. They are haploid, in meiosis they would be diploid. They are gametes instead of somatic cells. Boom, there's like four or five points. Just memorize your endpoint, and you can say anything you need to say about that. Okay, so I wanna quickly draw, wrapping up, but I wanna particularly draw metaphase one versus metaphase two, just to show the difference. Uh, again, I don't want to draw all of the cells because it would take forever, particularly because you have to draw crossing over um, and then it's just fun times. Um, so metaphase one versus metaphase two. First of all, you should just be able to tell because in theory, if it was metaphase two, you would be doing it with two cells. Um, but just to show what we mean by the lining up in bivalence. So if we were looking at metaphase one, we would see them lining up side by side like this. And again, the random orientation refers to the fact that I could have flipped these around. Crossing over has already occurred. So technically, if I'm drawing it, if you were asked to draw it, you would need to draw, indicate that in some way. I don't think you'd be likely needing to do it through color. So draw squiggly or something to indicate that. And then there's my metaphase one. So there's metaphase one. So that's what we mean by in pairs. There's my spindle fibers that I'll attach. If we're talking metaphase two, this time we would be looking 
and then lining up single file. So there's my blue, there's my purple, and this should look like mitosis as well. The only way you could tell it's definitely meiosis is because you should see some crossing over on some of those. Okay, and then, Okay, so while I'm on this, I wanna talk about what happens if an error occurs. So if we're talking mitosis, errors are going to occur. Uh, we do have checkpoints, so that's a little bit remembering back to cell cycle stuff. Um, so checkpoints will come along, I think that's topic one, and make sure that um, they are attached in the correct places and ad address it if not, or because we're just creating body cells, we'll just throw it out if it's wrong. With meiosis, because we're creating future people, um, errors are a big deal. So if something happens and the spindle fiber doesn't correctly attach, so let's say, you don't have to try to erase this on yours, but let's say this does a perfect job and this one does a great job attaching to this one, but it fails to attach to that one. If that happens, then when they divide an anaphase, both of them are going to end up going there because, again, they're actually kind of still overlapped in that bivalent form, and none of them is going to go to this side. It could also happen here in metaphase two. I could fail to correctly attach and have an error there. So if that happens, that is called non-disjunction. So if an error occurs... what will happen is the result will be kind of improper separation. So generally the error is actually the result of an error in metaphase, whereby the spindle fibers don't correctly attach, um, but where we see it is then you get to anaphase and they don't separate correctly. That is called non-disjunction. And the result of non-disjunction is going to be gametes that have extra or missing chromosomes. So it can happen either for every time there is an extra chromosome, the other gamete that was made that round is lacking one. So essentially when this happens, if this were to divide, this cell would actually be lacking in chromosome, this cell would actually have extra chromosomes. It can happen in manif at anaphase one or two. It tends to happen more in, two, in one. So like 70% of the time it happens in anaphase one. Uh, so essentially the way with the bivalence, it's just easier to not attach correctly. It tends to be better doing it in anaphase, in metaphase two and anaphase two. Uh, so we see it more often in the first round of meiosis and the consequences are worse in the first round of meiosis because it will create all four gametes being abnormal. If it were to actually happen in the second round, two of the gametes would be unaffected, so you would still have some gametes. If those gametes are fertilized, the result is something called aneuploidy. And so I say if they're fertilized, because bearing in mind that most gametes are not. And so this is a common occurrence in women that are older. Uh, in the individuals that are older, the males tend to sit, have a longer fertility period. So that's not as correlated with male age as it is with female age. Um, highly correlated with female age. So by the time a woman is reaching 40, uh, probably half of her eggs have some sort of aneuploidy in them. So very common, um, but also at that age, pregnancy becomes difficult anyway. Um, and so it just creates miscarriages or or people have stopped trying to get pregnant, therefore the abnormal eggs are never really discovered. So it's only really going to show up as an obvious event if it's fertilized leading to a development of a fetus, then you see potential evidence for the aneuploidy. How would you detect this? So if, and this is generally done, in the instance where it's done prior to birth. So if a woman is older and she is therefore concerned about this risk, one option would be to try to see if this has occurred uh, and test for aneuploidy in utero to have that information. And so what they would do is they would make a karyogram. 
I've always seen the word karyotype, but the IB has clarified that the karyogram is the actual picture. The karyotype is kind of the conclusion. So the karyotype is the conclusion or the information from it. So the karyotype would be like, it is a female with 46 chromosomes, three for chromosome 18. So that's the information you gather from the karyogram. I've never seen that distinction quite so outlined, um, but for the sake of this course, refer to it as a karyogram. If you're very specifically talking about the picture, if you're talking about kind of uh, an individual with Down syndrome has a karyotype that shows three chromosomes, then you could use that karyotype. Kind of a very, very random distinction. Um, so the karyogram is the picture and basically it allows you to kind of check two things. So a karyogram would reveal gender. However, rarely would you do a karyogram to determine gender. There are better ways to determine gender, including on an ultrasound, but also there's blood tests that show that. Um, because, but because it is a picture of the chromosomes, so it's a picture of the chromosomes, um, it will reveal gender and it will show the number of chromosomes. And if you see an extra or missing chromosome, that would indicate that aneuploidy has occurred. To do this, you have to use cells generally from the fetus, of course, if you're looking at before they're born, and they're generally best if they are in mitosis, often they use them in metaphase. So I'll grab a cell in metaphase because they're more lined up and it's just easier to take the image of that way. If you were asked to detect it, there were essentially three that you could potentially need to know about um, that kind of came up in the course. That would be Down syndrome, which is an extra 21. So that's trisomy, three copies of 21. And then the other two are related to the sex chromosomes. So Klinefelter's which is actually a trisomy 23, which presents as XXY. So they have an extra sex chromosome and they present as male. And then Turner syndrome, which is the only known monosomy that humans can survive with. It happens in all the chromosomes. It's just usually fatal. Uh, so other than 21, 13, and 18, having an extra of any, having an extra of any other chromosome is fatal. And then missing any chromosome other than 23 is fatal. So when we say fatal, it usually means either no pregnancy results. So fertilization might occur. And then by day three, it's failing to develop. And then the woman just might have her period a day or two late, never realize she was pregnant. Um, or it could cause a miscarriage kind of a little bit later in development. Uh, so that is karyotyping. Um, the pictures are pretty easy. You just look at the look for any groups that seem out of place and just know those three conditions. Okay, so that's everything meiosis. I'm going to move now into kind of actual inheritance patterns um, in our next little segment. Okay, so I'm going to go through these, and this is basically Punnett square problems. Um, so you need to kind of work out where you're at with this. If you have forgotten how to do these, totally go back and do um, some reading and go back through your class examples, because I'm not going to do a whole bunch of examples. It'll take forever. Um, most of you are probably, hopefully, pretty good at this. You just need a few reminders of the different types of problems you could see. Um, so I will tell you that my motto that I always told my students is when in doubt, cross it out. And what I mean by that is that unless it specifically asks you to back your answer up with the Punnett square, you do not have to. So if you're on a multiple choice question and it tells you, uh, you know, a parent is heterozygous, the other parent is the recessive phenotype, and you can be like, yeah, 50%, great. You don't need to draw the Punnett square. But if you're having a moment where you're like, mm -hmm, you have a minute and a half per question. So take the time to do the actual calculation if you need to. Um, so don't guess and lose a point on an easy question. Um, so have a think, do I know this? Am I confident? And if not, then do spend the time and actually go through it. Okay, so we're only for standard levels, you only have to do monohybrids, so that's nice. Uh, so we'll go through what are the kind of different categories that you could observe and what kind of ratios are worth knowing about. 
and then ATLs will pick up with your dihybrids when we get to your section. Uh, so first of all, a little bit when we say Mendelian, we are kind of saying what are the specific things that he discovered in his research. Non-Mendelian will pick up on a few things that Mendel himself did not observe with his pea plants, but we now know to happen. Um, and so we'll add a little bit from there. So remember when we talk about Mendel, he did his research with the pea plants. A couple of things that are really important to remember about his research is he did high pea plates. <laughs> Sorry about that. Pea plants. Okay, so he did lots of replications. So high replications, plus the way he did it was gathering of quantitative data. And when you combine those two things, so high replication and quantitative data, the result is highly reliable research. So that's a really good example of kind of high reliability. And in fact, what we still know to be true is that most of Mendel's conclusions were correct. Um, there are just traits that don't fit his category. So his way of explaining traits with complete dominance is really effective. Um, but we also now know that there are examples uh, that don't fit his patterns just because he was limited and only researching with pea plants. Okay, so what we'll look at for Mendelian traits is we're going to start with just looking at monohybrids. And he assumed two alleles and complete dominance. So for every gene, so basically they're saying for this trait, there is one gene that determines it. That one gene has only two alleles and one allele is completely dominant over the other. So that was kind of his primary mode of research. Um, and so just a couple of the most common things that you could see is you could see, well, what if both parents are heterozygous? If both parents are heterozygotes, then you should see a one to two to one ratio in the genotypes. And then that would give you a three to one phenotype ratio. So that's also just a reminder of your kind of genotype and phenotype ratios. So when we say a genotype ratio, we are looking at the actual allele combinations. When we look at a phenotype ratio, we're looking at the actual word or trait. So this is one dominant trait to two to one recessive trait. So that's kind of a common one that you will see. Uh, so the phenotype and genotype ratio in this case are not the same. Another common one you'll see is where one parent is heterozygous and the other is recessive. This cross is actually called a test cross because this individual, we know their genotype from their phenotype because anyone that has a recessive phenotype must have the recessive homozygous genotype. Um, and then we, this would be a heterozygote potentially with unknown, whether they have the dominant phenotype or a heterozygote. And so you could do the cross and then see what happens. If they are in fact heterozygotes, then you should see one big A little a to one little a little a, one dominant to one recessive. And again, I'm writing these with the ratios. You could also write this as your 50% and 50% like that. So just being clear on kind of those basic ones, a lot of this is terminology. Um, again, I'm not going through each individual term, uh, but you would need to know again, words like these are heterozygotes, or you might also see the term hybrids. And sometimes this you'll see purebred as a term, or you'll see homozygous dominant as a term. So just making sure you're good on your terminology. Okay, so again, in this case, big A dominant over little a. Heterozygotes have the same phenotype as the homozygous dominant. As we go through these patterns, I just am gonna make a quick note of what disorders that you would have to know. So there are human disorders that fit this kind of very Mendelian pattern, uh, whereby one allele is dominant over the other. Uh, in most cases, more often than not, 
the actual allele is, um, the disordered allele is recessive. So we call those autosomal, meaning it's not related to any of the sex chromosomes. Recessive, so having the disorder, you would have to have two copies to have it. Um, the main one that you would need to know for that is cystic fibrosis. And that would be for, I would recommend another one for your list of disorders that you might wanna study. So uh, in terms of it relates to chloride channels uh, and then because of improper movement of chlorine, uh, it causes not enough movement of water, causes mucus to get sticky, and then there's complications related to that. Um, so worth knowing a little bit about uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, the other one that I don't see as much in terms of system uh, symptoms and so forth showing up is albinism, which is the lack of pigmentation um, that is the result of a recessive gene. There are also some disorders that occur on a, again, non-sex chromosome, but the disorder is actually dominant. And we tend to not necessarily think about those as much because uh, we have a tendency to assume that disorders would be recessive, but they can actually be dominant. Uh, and the ones, the main one you would need to know about there would be Huntington's. And that is a dominant condition. The other one is achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism. And it's an interesting one because in that case, uh, homozygous dominant is lethal. So in that case, anyone who has the condition is a heterozygote, um, but not having the condition is actually recessive. Uh, so most people are like little d, little d, if you will. So those are some disorders that will often show up with that exact kind of pattern of inheritance. Um, and then there's lots of them. So my kids had a kidney condition that was actually uh, the result of an autosomal recessive condition related to kind of nephrine formation. So um, it's, it is still an important understanding in the terms of genetic disorders because some disorders do work that way. Um, kind of a non-Mendelian pattern would be to look at the idea of kind of co or incomplete dominance. And I'm just gonna flag kind of again that that is a, what we would consider to be non-Mendelian because I did see kind of an ERQ question that was like outlined some non-Mendelian patterns of inheritance. Um, so it's worth noting kind of which ones you could include. So usually that is talking about sec, uh, incomplete codominance and sex linkage. Uh, at an SL level, at an HL level, you could bring gene linkage in as well in terms of two genes on the same chromosome and even a little bit of polygenic inheritance, although Mendel did actually understand that. Uh, so more on that later. So incomplete or codominance. So in, when we say incomplete dominance, we are saying that the heterozygote is a blend. So what makes both of these unique is that the heterozygote has its own phenotype. So the heterozygote is not an exact copy of either parent, um, but in fact have their own one. So if we were talking in complete dominance, it would be like flower color red, times flower color white, and then the F1 would be all pink. So they are actually showing a unique phenotype. And then if you were to cross the F2, that would be CRCW times CRCW, and you would get 25% red to 50% pink to 25% white. If you were like, oh my goodness, what did you just do? Come back to when it out, cross it out. Draw the little pun in squares. So this seems to be the notation they're using uh, just to show that if you use capital lowercase, that is making the presumption that one is dominant over the other. So to avoid that, we use the kind of subscript thing. When we talk codominance, in this case, rather than a blend, so you notice pink is an in-between uh, red and white, so ink is in-between. So think pink ink. Oh. Codominance is both are shown. Um, so when we say codominance, we're gonna look at both. And then uh, the specific example you need to know for that is ABO blood types. Make a note when we say ABO blood types, they are not only codominant, but also multiple alleles. So this is multiple alleles and codominance. 
So what we're looking at here is three alleles. So little i is the O allele, big I A and big I B are the alleles for A and for B, and they are co-dominant. The question that they seem to like asking about is how could a parent with type A blood and a parent with type B blood have children with all the different blood types? So I am gonna draw this one. Uh, it showed up on the revision test that the SLs just did. So the mom would have to be heterozygous, the dad would also have to be heterozygous. This one is IAIB. And again, because that is co-dominant, that is its own blood type, which is ABO blood, AB blood. Um, and we did do that a little bit in um, some of the physiology stuff, so stuff and in terms of immune system, in terms of understanding that that means they have both A and B antigens and markers. IBI, this one has type B blood. IAI, this one has type A blood. And little i, little i, this one has type O blood. So there we see an example where they have all the different blood types. Um, so that's probably the most commonly asked about thing um, if you're looking at uh, codominance. Then, and then for my disorders, so I don't forget about it, there's only one disorder that you frequently see show up uh, under this, and that is gonna be our old friend that we just talked about, so that tells us right now. Uh, so a co-dominant disorder is sickle cell anemia. So remember how I just told you that sickle cell anemia uh, is related to that single mutation? So it is also a situation whereby it only affects 50% of the blood cells if you're heterozygotes. So heterozygotes have 50% sickle cells. So we do actually see an in-between phenotype, whereby if you were to look in their blood type blood, you would see some sickled and some normal. So some of both. Uh, and they do have an in-between phenotypic expression as well, uh, whereby they do have a slightly lower oxygenation. In the general, as long as they are 50% normal, the heterozygotes, it's called like sickle cell trait, generally are not very heavily affected. And in fact, they actually pose a slight advantage to malaria um, because malaria with the presence of the sickle cell slows down the development of malaria. Uh, so in areas where there are high instances of sickle cell malaria, a sickle of malaria, you see higher instances of sickle cell anemia because the heterozygotes have an advantage. So all interesting stuff. Okay, last category for this is also a non-Mendelian category, uh, and that's sex linkage. So linkage linkage is when two normal genes just are on the same chromosome. That is an HL only concept. SLs though, you do need to know about sex linkage as an example, and that's when a gene happens to be on a sex chromosome. And this is again another example of a non-Mendelian trait because that is not something that Mendel himself observed in his plants. Uh, so it is not part of his kind of understanding. And instead, it was actually done by someone named Thomas Hunt Morgan. And he actually discovered both sex linkage and linked genes. Uh, so for HL is kind of a double thing there. Uh, so he did research on Drosophila uh, and they do actually have X and Y chromosomes like we do. Uh, and he actually found the red eye color is linked to the X chromosome. So his research with Drosophila added to this. Uh, just a little bit of context for this. Um, so generally speaking, when we say sex linkage, we are talking X-linked, uh, you can have Y-linked traits. The Y chromosome is very small um, and females will just never have the trait. So it's kind of a boring one to work out in a Punnett square because if the dad has it, the boys have it, the dad doesn't have it, the boys don't have it, it's kind of boring. We will come, up, come back to when we do pedigrees, but generally talking when we say sex linkage, we are saying that the trait is on, the gene for the trait is on the X chromosome and therefore these are inherited differently 
because females have two copies, but males do not. So when you are doing these traits, you just have to be really careful um, that you need to actually write out the actual X um, or it won't work. So you must write with X. The kind of most common example you'll see just because it's an example where the gender matters is that you'll have a mom who's the carrier. So she has both copies and then you'll have a dad who is unaffected because in this case the gender matters for the offspring so if we were to say therefore mom is x big a x little a and dad is x little a or big a so i will assume it's dominant why so then i am going to just draw the cross for this like so. So here's mom, x, big A, or oh, sorry, we'll dive dad across the top. I think technical notation is dad's across the top, mom's along the side. Won't really make any difference in terms of their outcome. And then when we write phenotype ratio for these, we do want to include gender. So in this case, we have a normal female this is also a normal female. Remember being a carrier is not a phenotype. You do not know your carrier without genetic testing or family history. Um, so we do not consider that to be a genotype. This is going to be a normal male, but then this is an affected male. So in this case, it does matter because 100% of the females um, are normal and 50% of the males have the condition. Um, so this is why we generally see uh, these traits are more common in males. In particular, the only way for a female to have a recessive condition like this is if dad also has it and mom has it. So daughters can only have it if dad has it. So because dad cannot be a heterocarrier, the only way he can pass it on to his daughter is if he has it. His son doesn't have to have it because mom can pass it on through her being a carrier. Okay, and that's gonna come up again when we get to pedigree, so it's just worth mentioning. But the main thing here is make sure that you are writing the X, because if you don't write the X, you will not solve it correctly. Um, and then what are our disorders here? So when we talk disorders, there's two that I would like you to know for this. Uh, one is color blindness, so red, green color blindness. And it's kind of a typical thing whereby the percent of males is higher than females that have it. And then the other one is hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder. Uh, but is also sex linked and some interesting stuff related to royal families where you'll see kind of uh, high instances of it due to um, inbreeding essentially and so forth. So that's another one to know about uh, for those kind of characteristics. Uh, well, I'm going to erase this and then we'll do pedigrees. Okay, moving along to pedigrees, and a lot of times these are paired with Punnett squares, whereby instead of just telling you what the parents are, you have to look at a pedigree, use the pedigree to work out what the characteristic is, like what the, what the type of inheritance it is, and then do a Punnett square from there. So a lot of times this is all building, um, but you need to be aware of kind of what the different types of inheritance we just talked are about first. Uh, so just quick reminder, when we are looking at a pedigree, if we see a square, it is a male, if we see a female, it is a circle. If it is shaded, it means they have the disorder. So this is an affected male. Or we can say, I say disorder, it could be just the trait. More often than not, in the real world, if we're doing a pedigree, we're doing it to track a disorder because nobody cares who has freckles in a family. So we're not necessarily drawing pedigrees for just random traits. Um, so we often use the term affected meaning usually has the disorder or the trait if it's non-disorder based. Okay, so if we are trying to do a pedigree problem, we want you to kind of basically follow these three steps. 
Um, so step one, and my recommendation is always to go ahead and check your gender ratio first. It's harder to work out dominant or recessive and then backtrack into that. So first thing you're gonna do is check your gender ratio. And when I say check gender ratio, one advice is to include checking it within families. Because one, sometimes you'll see it very clearly in a family where it's like, oh, all the sons are affected and none of the daughters are, or all of the daughters are affected. And yet, if you look at the whole thing, there's enough kind of dads and so forth that sometimes you won't see as obvious. So particularly if you can find a couple families where they have a lot of children, um, it's really easier to see often within a family. So within kind of a single set of siblings, do we see a relationship um, is important because it might be the daughters are all affected, the sons are not, but the dad was. And so then you're like, oh, it's two daughters, one male. But if you look at the offspring line, it stands out really clearly. Okay, so from that, you can generally reach one of two conclusions. First of all, you would say there's an equal number of male and female affected. So it is equal or very close to equal or within families, there's no obvious thing. Or you would say there seems to be an uneven number of males and females affected. And again, it could be overall or particularly in a couple families that stands out to you. Okay, if there's an equal number of male and female affected, then that tells you right away that it is not likely to be on any sort of sex chromosome, so it is likely an autosomal trait. In which case, the next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna check for these specific family patterns. And there's two, you're just basically trying to determine between autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant. If you are looking at uh, recessive, what you'll see is unaffected parents going on to have an affected child. Double points if the affected child is a daughter because that guarantees it's autosomal. So in this case, if the daughter is affected and dad is not, but the daughter is, then that confirms that that is autosomal. Even if it was a son, if you see there was no gender difference and you see that skipping of generations, I don't love that term, uh, that would tell you that. So if you see unaffected parents having an affected child. So if you're writing that in description, unaffected parents who go on to have an affected child, that is what's telling you that it is definitely autosomal recessive. If you do not see any evidence of that, so anyone who has it always has a parent who has it, that would suggest it's likely to be dominant. You can be sure it's dominant if you see the reverse pattern. So if you actually have two affected parents and they go on to have an unaffected child, that is not possible if it is recessive. They would have to be lily, 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 lily. Children must have it. So if you see this pattern, then it is definitely dominant. Hopefully it would show you one of those two clear patterns. Um, if you never saw any skipping of generations, I'd probably lean towards dominant, but it's nice if you see that because that tells you for sure. If you were instead, so remember this is autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant. If you see an uneven number, then your next step in this case is going to be to study the specific gender pattern. So you need to study gender more closely. And you're looking for basically three different possibilities. So one possibility is that what you see is that only males are affected and all males match dad. If you see that, then that is actually a Y-linked condition. That is not the usual one they're going to give you. Um, so just it's just one to be aware of. Again, there's just not that many conditions like that. So that's just me kind of 
putting that out there for fun, um, but that would be one that you could see. If you see more males affected, but not all males. So more males affected do not all match dad. So if you see any females, or even if it's all male, but they don't match the dad, then that would tell you that what you're looking at is X-linked recessive. That's probably the most common that you'll see because there are actual examples of that, like we talk about in terms of hemophilia um, and colorblindness. So that is a kind of very legitimate one. What you can see, and this one is again kind of one that's done more for checking your skills than anything, is that you can actually see instances where more females are affected. And that would only be the case if it was X-linked dominant. So in this case, because females have two copies, if either parent gives them to it, they're affected. So they have kind of twice the likelihood of being affected. If you think that's the case, kind of, kind of just check each family and make sure that that lines up. So kind of even go through and put like a little X big B or something and be like, oh yeah, that works for that one. So I would say that one's pretty rare. Uh, the VCE tends to like to ask it to kind of trick you. Uh, it doesn't look like the IV's quite as keen on it, um, probably because there's just not that many traits that are X-linked dominant. Um, but if you do see like, oh, six females to four males, have a quick look and see, oh uh, yeah, does that look right? Um, and just rule, make sure before you say for sure that that is the case, that it works for all the different families. Okay, so then once you've done step two, then you can do step three, which is basically based on what you decide you're going to assign alleles and determine genotypes when possible. So in some cases, you may not be able to tell the genotype. Um, so, uh, for instance, if you have an individual who has parents that were not affected and then you have two children and one's affected and one's not, you actually can't tell for sure if the other child is a carrier or not. Um, so it's not always possible, but if you can. So when we say again, assign letters, so in this case, if it's recessive, we're saying like these ones are little, little. Uh, and then if this one was dominant, then we were actually saying in this case, this is the little, little. And then if, of course, if you're X-linked recessive, you would be like X little A. If you're X-linked dominant, you'd be X big A. So your letters depend on the pattern. Um, and then when we say determine genotypes, there's just one kind of rule I want to put to you, that someone is definitely a carrier. So it doesn't mean you can't be for other reasons, but they are definitely a carrier if one of two things only. So they're definitely a carrier if their child has it, because if their child has it, then their child had to get a little copy from each parent. So each of these parents had to be big A, little a. So now we know for sure that they are carriers, or if their parent has it. And same kind of argument, if their parent has it, their parent was little, little, um, and then that means they had that to pass on. We only use the word carrier with recessive conditions. The word carrier means does not have the trait but could pass it on. That is actually just not a terminology used for dominant traits um, because if you have it, you show it. However, you could use the same argument and say definitely a heterozygote. If your child does not have it, you could just reverse it and the same two arguments would be true. You just generally don't see it. Um, and then just remember that if we're talking X-linked recessive, in this case, only females can be carriers. So if we're saying who's a carrier, it's the same two rules, but males cannot be. So those rules only apply to females. Okay, so I think that's kind of everything for pedigrees. Um, it was a pretty short one, but just being able to add that to then going on and doing uh, Punnett squares. Um, but just 
it is important to be able to follow that pattern. Last thing we need to do for um, SLs is the stuff on biotechnology. So we'll do that next and then that'll wrap it up for SL. Okay, so genetic technology. So I'm gonna divide this into basically four kind of columns um, and look at kind of four applications that you need to know a little bit about, which would be gel electrophoresis. Um, and then looking at transgenic organisms, which I would have called transformation. Um, and then looking at GMOs, which is genetically modified organisms, which can relate to transgenic organisms or it can be modifications kind of within um, an organism without kind of inserting other organisms material and then cloning. So those are going to kind of be, actually I may put G the GMO kind of stuff together and do kind of three big categories. So this is just going to be a summary of things that you could have to talk about. Uh, I have seen some like a FRQ that was like discussed genetic uh, technology. So hopefully by doing this as kind of three separate things that would give you a kind of a lens to talk about it as well in a FRQ without just feeling like you're rambling. Uh, so this is all, sorry, I should put a heading. This is all in the category of biotechnology. I ran a super nerdy biotechnology club at my old school. So um, yeah, we stayed after school and did biotech. So uh, definitely an area I think is interesting, uh, but we're gonna try to again, keep it succinct, because succinct, even an eight mark question, there's only so much you need to say. Uh, so first cat area we're gonna look at is gel electrophoresis, and I'm gonna put PCR in with that. PCR can be done for other things, but most of the time, it's kind of partnered here, whereby we're amplifying the DNA to then run it through a gel electrophoresis. Um, and then we're going to look at kind of GMOs, so genetically modified organisms. And with all of this stuff, there's particularly in the GMO category, there's lots of examples. I'm hoping you remember some of them from class. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them all, but if you uh, probably need at least a couple of good examples to back up a, if you're writing a longer response. And then cloning is kind of our last of our categories. Okay, so let's look at gel electrophoresis really quickly. Uh, and I'm gonna draw a little gel here. I'm sure I can. Okay, so I'm drawing this little grid thing because the idea is we're using agarose gel uh, and the agarose gel has pores in it. Um, so what we, if we were going to do this, the first thing we would do is we would cut the DNA. Well, first thing we would do is we would need to make lots of copies of the DNA. So we're gonna collect and amplify the DNA. And I'm gonna come back to that because that is using PCR. So that is a whole kind of separate thing, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but essentially a lot of times we're getting DNA from like a crime scene, a single hair, a cheek swab, and we want to use lots and lots of the DNA. So a lot of times we get it and then we want to make a bazillion copies of it. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to cut the DNA with restriction enzymes. And those are going to come up again over here. So those are going to be important or restrict endonucleases. I'm gonna use the term restriction enzymes because that's fine. Uh, so you're gonna cut the DNA with restriction enzymes into different size bands. Then you're gonna hook up, you're gonna load the DNA into the gel. So an agarose gel that has pores which is what I'm showing with my little crissy crossies. And then you're going to hook it up to electric electricity load nodes. Okay. And then run with a current. And what's important is the DNA is negative. So it's going to move. So here's where I loaded my DNA and it's going to move towards the positive. So it's gonna end up separating out into the gel into the positive. So DNA moves towards the positive and 
how quickly it can move depends on its size. So it'd be like if I created a little obstacle course, cause that'd be fun. And I told you guys to run through it. And I was like, you can either run through by yourself with a partner or linked arms with three people. Well, the people who get through it fastest would be the people who are individuals because it's easier to move or maneuver your way around if you're not kind of linked into other people. So same idea. So negative DNA moves towards the positive electron. And then the smaller the fragment, the faster it moves. So essentially what would have happened here is that this suggests that once upon a time, this was their DNA and I cut it into a very small fragment, a slightly bigger fragment and a large one. And then maybe, I'm gonna erase that one, maybe this person's fragment, when I cut it, it with the same, cut it with the same thing, it only cut into two fragments that were both a little bit bigger. So that's kind of showing how many fragments did you have and how big were they? So this was my smallest, medium, largest, largest, medium in that case. So that's kind of what that is showing you there. And then from that, you're going to have these separated into bands. And that kind of pattern is unique to you. So each person's kind of pattern is kind of specific to them. So a lot of times they'll cut parts of DNA that we know are highly polymorphic. So individuals have a lot of differences in like that kind of repeated sequence. Um, so we'll use kind of what we cut, the enzymes that we know to cut at certain places, cut in areas that we're gonna get like lots of variability. Um, and that creates your DNA profile, or I've always used the term DNA fingerprint. So either one. Uh, and again, that is unique to you. And so because it is unique to you, you can use that DNA profile for different things, including forensics. So if you were looking at forensics, you would expect it to be an exact match. So you get DNA from a crime scene, you get a couple different uh, criminals or suspects, sorry, uh, give them gears, and then if the bands are the same pattern, that tells you that's the person who did it. You can also do it for kind of paternity or family relationships. In that case, it wouldn't be an exact match, but the offspring would have bands that are shared by either parent. So if you had baby and mom, and then you're like, oh, there's four bands that baby has that mom doesn't have, then dad has to have given those bands. So you can check kind of potential fathers, and if dad has those four bands, it could be a match. Uh, so you can do that for kind of forensics or paternity testing using the DNA profile. Um, okay, so that's kind of a very, very fast overview. Uh, when we talk about how you would amplify DNA, so you can make copies of the DNA first using the polymerase chain reaction. And again, this could be a whole lesson, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but it basically is kind of like artificial DNA replication using a special enzyme and heat. So we're using heat, using primers, and an enzyme called TAC polymerase, which is specifically used because it does not denature at high temperatures. So you put the DNA in, you expose it to heat, it tears into two strands because of the heat. You expose it to primers that are kind of known to grab onto certain places and kind of start new strands. Then you change the temperature to encourage it to actually copy and you use instead of DNA polymerase, you use a, a form of DNA polymerase, but a specific one that can run at high temperatures. Again, feel free to make a little card on polymerase chain reaction and read a little bit more about it. Um, but if you were writing a whole question on genetic um, technology, you'd probably be pretty good if you could just say that it is the technique that is used uh, to make lots of copies of DNA uh, using a special enzyme. Okay, so that is one option there is gel electrophoresis and PCR. 
Genetically modified organisms is basically kind of changing the genes of an organism. So there's essentially two kind of general categories for that. So you can just alter like an individual organism's genes. So you can uh, make its genes for creating sucrose um, stronger and therefore it will enable it to be a sweeter strawberry. What we're gonna kind of talk more about is that are more interesting is transgenic organizations. So transgenic means that we took a gene from a different organism and inserted it into that organism. So we essentially added um, a different species gene. So we're placing a gene from a different species into that organism. So again, I've always called that transformation as the method um, that is how one, the general kind of term for it is to get it to accept kind of a gene from a different organism. And the way that we generally do that is with plasmids. So most of the time this is done with bacteria and plasmids. Um, so essentially we place the gene of interest on a plasmid and then expose bacteria to it. So for instance, here's my plasmid, little round of DNA, and let's say that the gene I'm interested in is human insulin. So what I can actually do is I can cut that plasmid and kind of remove that piece and insert this human insulin gene in instead. So when we place the gene on the plasmid, there are two things that we'll need to make that happen. So we're gonna use again restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are just little DNA scissors. So that is what going, is able, gonna enable me to make that cut and remove part of the plasmid and then cut the gene. And then I'm also gonna to need to seal it up and that's gonna be done with an enzyme ligase. So I'm gonna use restriction enzymes and ligase, and I'm gonna place that gene on a plasmid and then expose bacteria to it. A lot of times, transformation is not gonna be 100%. Uh, so just because the bacteria exposed to it doesn't mean they're gonna accept it. So one other thing they often do is they insert an additional gene on it for resistance to antibiotics. So this would be ampicillin resistance, which is an antibiotic. So they're also going to glue that in. Then they're going to expose the bacteria. And that's a whole process called heat shocking. And some of the bacteria will accept the plasmid and then they'll take in the plasmid and start using those genes. And if I wanna check which ones have actually done that, I can actually grow it on antibiotic plates. And then what will happen is, that means that most of the bacteria will not actually be able uh, to survive. So only the transformed bacteria will survive. So only those with the plasmid survive. And now I have the ones that have my special plasmid. Then I essentially have kind of two options. First of all, I can just get my bacteria then to produce something for me. So now I can just use the bacteria to create human insulin. Or I can then cause that bacteria to infect another organism. So I could get the bacteria to infect like a plant or something like that. And so now that transgenic organism is actually inside another organism. And so now they're creating the protein kind of for the plant. So that's kind of an extra step along the way for it. Um, and that's kind of been done um, with golden rice 
um, and other ways of doing it. So uh, BT toxin is an example where they've actually exposed the plants to a plasmid, to bacteria that have accepted a plasmid that makes a toxin. Uh, and then that toxin is released into the plants, which causes um, other, it to have a pesticide basically property. So those are kind of examples uh, where that has been done. Uh, so this you might want to look at this example is the BT toxin and that BT toxin has a specific, it's done to be a pesticide, um, but it has implications because it's kind of spreading through the wind then and then it's causing damage to kind of non predatory ones as well, including monarch butterflies. So there's just, I'm trying to add in a few things along the way that if you want to go back, if you have extra time and read about, that's just kind of a little extra thing. Um, and then another example that you could look at would be um, golden rice. So that's using a beta carotene gene and placing it, which would be something you would find like from carrots and so forth, um, and placing that gene inside of rice. And that enables it to produce vitamin A. And so then that's been used in areas where there's vitamin A deficiencies. So that's kind of separate. That's actually not using bacteria. That's a more straightforward one. So that would be kind of just what we would consider to be our general GMOs. Um, that are not quite as complex, uh, but we can insert those in. So again, that's a lot of information. Uh, you're unlikely to have, more likely than anything, you would have a bit of a prompt in the story and then answer some question about it. The most kind of complicated thing would be if you had to actually explain that process. It is a bit complex. Um, okay, and then the last one that we would, you could be asked about is cloning. So when we're talking cloning, uh, we are talking about essentially just creating a genetically identical offspring from only one parent. So they're going to be identical to the parent. Of course, that can be done naturally um, through asexual reproduction. So occurs naturally through all different forms of asexual reproduction, uh, which can include even things like budding and yeast. Uh, you can see it occur naturally even in more complex organisms. Uh, so for instance, you see it form like plantet plantlets, where a plant creates a second, like through the root system and then has a separate organism grow up from the root system. And so you can kind of grow several plants that are all genetically identical because they're coming off of that center one. Um, you can see it through budding, even in simple uh, in fragmentation, things like that. You can see certain organisms that actually create diploid eggs whereby the egg can then develop into a zygote that's identical to the parent. So there are instances of it occurring and naturally. Uh, and then there's also a few where you would have to look at where it can be kind of done intentionally. So one would be stem cutting. Uh, so stem cuttings is basically trying to take advantage of this same concept as plantlets, but basically removing the th bottom third of a stem, taking off the leaves, and then placing it in kind of a ideal environment um, and trying to let it grow into a new part. It came up again in HL, a little bit more on the uh, process for doing that in terms of using sterile medium and so forth um, is just a way and I think the particular little dot point for this was to be able to design an experiment. So it's something that could come up in like a paper three question, uh, something like that. So experimental method things like making sure every all your other environmental conditions are the same and so forth. Uh, fragmentation which is where we kind of remove part and then it regrows. The particular example, and this came up on the HL test that you guys just did, is doing that from an embryo. So you can do a fragmentation of an embryo, whereby essentially you take an eight cell embryo where the cells are no longer, are not yet specialized, and then you can divide it and then put them into different surrogates. And that's basically just creating 
identical twins, uh, identical octuplets. So that's the same way that identical twins form is just an embryo splits. So it's basically taking advantage of that process. Um, and then, of course, the more challenging thing is this is basically taking an embryo at the stage where it's not yet specialized. Uh, so cloning adults is more challenging because they already have specialized cells. Uh, and so the example that you could see there is Dolly. And so Dolly was made from mammary gland cells, which are already differentiated cells. So she was made from mammary gland cells. Um, and that process that was done is called somatic cell nuclear transfer. So the somatic cell refers to the fact that it was from a mammary gland. Um, and so basically they had to take kind of nucleus from the mammary gland. And then they actually inserted it into an egg cell that had been had its nucleus removed. So this is an egg cell that had its own nucleus removed. So an empty egg. So then they took this nucleus and put it into here, like so. Then they had to give it a good little bolt of electric shock. Woo! And then they had to then put it inside of a surrogate. I'm not going to try to draw a sheet. And then the surrogate would give birth to it. Ooh, I can't even spell. And it would, of course, look like the nucleus. Okay, so that is all for SLs. So HLs, I'm going to keep going, um, which I know makes this long, but topic 10 HL is fairly short. So rather than doing a separate video on it, I'm gonna do it where it's relevant because it's all related to this stuff that we just talked about. So it makes more sense to kind of do it where it goes. So SLs, goodbye and good luck. I'll be sending, uploading new ones uh, in a day or so. Um, but SL, HLs hang in and we're gonna go and talk a little bit more about gene linkage mainly uh, is basically what it all boils down to. So to do that, we need to talk a little bit more about independent assortment and crossing over and then how that relates to whether genes are linked and end with chi squares. So probably another 30 minutes or so of HL material would be my guess. Uh, and then that'll round us off for genetics. Okay, hi. So now HLs only. We need to do a little bit more um, and we're gonna do the first two parts of topic 10. So topic 10 is um, essentially more on meiosis and then uh, more on kind of gene linkage and then a little bit on speciation. I'll leave that to the video on topic five. Um, so what I wanna kind of try to organize is what is kind of the theme because it sometimes the HL stuff can seem like bits and pieces, but it actually is a one pretty set unit, which is essentially looking at the inheritance of two traits. So, so far what we've looked at when we looked at the eight SL stuff is we looked at a single gene. So now we're looking at what if we are looking at two genes and how can we look at their inheritance together? So that could be things like looking at, okay, is the P both yellow or green? And is it round or wrinkled? Or they can be things that might be a little bit more related. So are we looking at kind of hair that's dark versus light and straight versus curly? So now we're looking at phenotypes of dark curly hair, dark straight hair, light curly hair, light straight hair. So we're kind of getting that idea of particularly when you look at traits that kind of are related to uh, a similar part of the body, you can see why maybe considering two traits at a time uh, is relevant. So when we talk about this, there's essentially two options. The genes for the two traits are on separate chromosomes. So we know we have 23,000 genes and only 23 sets of chromosomes. So lots of genes are gonna have to be on the same chromosome. Um, but at the end of the day, lots are going to be on totally different chromosomes. So statistically, it's more likely they're on different chromosomes than the same. So we're gonna start with that. So the first thing that we're gonna consider is that we are looking at two genes that are on different chromosomes. And there's kind of 
several different kind of terminology things we want to use when we talk about that. Uh, so first of all, when we say that, that is essentially what Mendel assumed. So Mendel did talk about this, but when Mendel looked at how these kind of traits work, he made the assumption that we were talking about them being unrelated to one another. He didn't have the terminology chromosomes that we have. He just said like they're independent of one another. Uh, so on that note, what he, the way he phrased it is that they independently assort, which essentially is saying how one is inherited has no bearing on how the other is inherited. So they're inherited independently of one another. Another term that you'll see, particularly when we talk about the opposite, is that we would say these genes are unlinked. So that's just another way of saying that they're independent. So what happens with one is not related to what happens on the other. They are not linked to one another. So what I wanna look at is for each of these, what does that look like in terms of meiosis? And then what does that look like in terms of kind of problem solving? So if we were to look at this in terms of meiosis, this comes up particularly in metaphase one. Because what this is saying, we talked briefly about this already in the SL video, uh, this idea of random kind of orientation of bivalence, uh, which is another way of saying that is independent assortment. So random orientation of bivalence is the actual kind of meiosis terminology. What Mendel said is that that is independent assortment. So you'll kind of see both terms used somewhat interchangeably um, for this. So let's look at what this means. So I'm gonna do this with a picture and some letters. So we're gonna use our kind of offensive gender stereotypes where we're gonna use our, these are our girl chromosomes, these are boy chromosomes. Um, so let's say here that we have chromosome one, we have mom's version and dad's version. For this particular instance, I'm just not going to draw crossing over. We're gonna talk about that as our next thing, but because they will draw on the part of the chromosome that didn't cross over anyway, uh, so we're just gonna kind of temporarily put that aside because it just isn't overly relevant for what we're talking about. Okay, so here's my two chromosomes, and let's say that mom is big for both. So she is big A on this chromosome and big B on this chromosome, and dad is little for both. So what we're saying at random alignment or orientation is that this can happen or equally likely. So 50% of the time they line up like this for these two chromosomes and these two genes. The other 50% of the time it flips so this time, and it doesn't really matter which one I flip, but I'm just gonna flip the second one. These two line up this way, but these two switch locations. So instead, they line up like this. Like so. Okay, and so then this is big A, little a, and then this is little b, big b. So when these actually go all the way through and make gametes, what we'll see and the options of these are is that if it lines up this way, the gametes will be big A, big B. So those will separate. These will separate again. We'll end up with gametes have big A and big B. And then these, when they separate, are going to be little a, little b. But equally likely are this arrangement, so that we also can make gametes that have big A, little b, little a, big b. And all of these are equally likely. So none of those combinations are more common than the others. That's just kind of how the different options are because it happens half the time each way. So sometimes it gets those two, sometimes it gets those two. And then on the whole, if you look at the parents making multiple kind of gametes, you would have gametes that have all of those kind of equally. Okay, so then if we were then doing a problem on this, this, like I said, is what Mendel assumed. And so we can work these problems out using a dihybrid cross.
So remember your dihybrid crosses are going to be your 16 box Punnett squares. And these are going to be the gametes. These are the headings for the boxes. So anytime you do a dihybrid cross, you are always assuming independent assortment. So if you're doing a dihybrid cross, this inherently assumes independent assortment. That's a really important thing for where we're going with this. So if you're doing that, uh, those are kind of what the headings would be for the boxes. So this is obviously a situation where the individual is big A, little a, big B, little e. Same even if you write it, write it this way, and this is the result of that. So let's go through revising how to make dihybrid crosses. So I showed you that this is all how you would get this. A technique um, for kind of making sure you get all four is to use the foil technique. which is first, outside, inside, last. So let's say for the case of this example, we have parents that are big A, little a, big B, little b, and then the other parent is little a, little a, little b, little b. So first, outside, inside, last is just a way of making sure you don't miss any combinations. If that doesn't make sense, you're like, I can just obviously see it, then you don't need to worry about it. But F is the first of each, so that's gonna be the first A and the first B. O is the outside, so the two letters that are on the outside. So that's big A, little b. I is inside, that's gonna be these guys sandwiched here in the middle. And L is the last of each, which is little a, little b. So it gives you the exact same thing as this, it's just a technique you can use. Of course, again, you should be able to tell from looking at this one that they're all going to be the same, but in theory, you could go through it and be little a, little b, little a, little b, little a, little b, little a, little b. So you could, in theory, solve it that way and get to the same thing. So then, those are what you are going to put over the boxes. So you will take the parent's genotype, which again are written like this, so you always write the letters there. And then that's how you would set up your 16 boxes. That. You can use shortcuts. So for instance, in this case, because one parent's gametes are all little a, little b, in theory, I actually don't even need to work out each column. I could just work it out once and put a line. Uh, so don't be afraid to do that to save yourself some time unless it asks for the Punnett square in an ERQ or S short answer question like that. And then I'm not going to work out this whole one, um, but I, well, actually I will, I'll just do the arrow. So be sure you write A's next to each other. And then I'm just showing this to show that's the case for all of them. A's next to each other, then B's next to each other. Like that, and then so forth. You're rarely going to be asked genotype ratios. You're generally going to be asked phenotype ratios. Um, there's two that are worth knowing. Um, and as we go through this, they'll come up quite a bit. So this particular cross here was big A, little a, big B, little b, times little a, little a, little b, little b, which is often referred to as a test cross. If you were trying to determine if the genes were in fact on different chromosomes or not, this is the most frequent one that you would do because what you see is it has a 25%, 25%, 25% cross. So you get a one to one to one ratio. So you should get equal of all four phenotypes. Uh, so all phenotypes should be equally represented. So that's kind of the usual cross that you would do if you were trying to tell if two things were linked or not is do this cross and then say are all four equal if so then it looks like yes in fact they are on different chromosomes the other one that shows up that's worth noting again you can do any of these um, the one that you don't want to do is the big a little a big b little b 
times big A, little a, big B, little B, um, because it's nasty and has a whole bunch of different boxes. Uh, so that one is definitely worth noting. It is nine to three to three to one, where nine are gonna have the dominant phenotype for both. Three are gonna be dominant for one and recessive for one. The other three are recessive for the first one and dominant for the second. And then one are recessive, recessive. Um, so definitely memorize that one, because unless the problem makes you work it out, you'll save quite a bit of time with that. Okay, so again, that was really fast. If you think dihybrids are something that you're a little bit eh on, go back and do some practice problems on it. Uh, usually, if you can get it set up, you're in pretty good shape. So then the question becomes, well, what if you did all this, and that was not what you got? So you got to an answer, and it was not one-to-one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one -to -one. Most likely then what you're looking at is going all the way back to the beginning and saying, if it doesn't behave how you expect it to, if it's way different, and we'll get to like, what does way different mean? We get to chi-square. But if it doesn't look like you expected it to, that's a sign that you might be looking at two genes that are in fact on the same chromosome. So let's have a look at what that looks like um, and kind of draw that really quickly. And then we'll talk a bit about how you can use chi-square, the kind of two different ways to tell. Uh, and then there's like one last little bit, which is on continuous versus discrete uh, traits that we'll fill in. So, so far, like we said, the general assumption Mendel made was there on different chromosomes. He didn't really understand chromosomes. It just appeared to him that the traits were not related to one another. So going back to our friend Thomas Morgan, so he was the one who actually worked out in Drosophila that some traits appeared to be linked to the X chromosome. So he also discovered that some traits appeared to be coming together more often. So you tended to see some combinations more than others. Uh, so he came up with those idea that those genes might be linked to one another, uh, which we now understand occurs when they are on the same chromosome. So if two genes are on the same chromosome, we say generally that they are linked. So a little bit of, as we get into this, I'll come back to this point, because sometimes if genes are really far away on the same chromosome, they actually act as if they're unlinked because they get crossed over so often. Um, so we'll come back to that. But generally speaking, if we're on the same chromosome, and I'm just gonna add close together, because technically if they're linked, they should not just be on the same chromosome, but reasonably close together, and that's why they stay together. So if you think about this, if they are on the same chromosome, they always line up together in metaphase. So they always line up together. So they are not separated in that stage. So in that whole idea of independent assortment and separation, they're actually staying together. So as a result, they tend to stay in their original combinations. So tend to stay in kind of original, we'll call it, we'll call them parentals in a second. However, and this is a really important however, and this is, I wanted to kind of introduce a slightly different order, but they can be separated when crossing over occurs between them. So they tend to stay together unless separated by crossing over. So this is gonna be our moment to now look a little bit more at crossing over and in particular in respect to this concept. So we're gonna do crossing over a little bit more and also add some letters to it. So I used A and B in the last one and I wanna do the same here. So now I'm down to just two colors because I'm no longer looking at separate chromosomes. So now I have mom's version and dad's version. And she is big A, big B. But now they are on the same chromosome. And he's little a, little a, little b. Okay, so now what's going to happen is when crossing over occurs, so they're going to come together and kind of overlap on top of each other. So just 
revising a few terms, that forms a bivalent. So bivalent forms during synapsis, which is just the name for them coming together. So this is lots of fun. And then the actual point where they connect is called the chiasma. Okay, and so then they are going to swap material. So here I have my A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. So when that happens, now what I'm going to see is even though I said they were going to go together, they're still together on this side, but on this side, <coughs> now I have a little B there. things there okay and then over here I'm going to have my little a little a and then this one is now going to have a big B and this is still going to have the little B so now they have formed new combinations so these that's called a parental because that's in a combination that we saw it in and one of the two parents, really one of the two grandparents. It's a little bit confusing when you think about it because you're like, this is all gamete formation. So the maternal copy and the paternal copy. This is again an original combination. And then these are called recombinants. Where it gets tricky is it doesn't get separated by crossing over every time. So it is sometimes separated by crossing over. And it does relate to how close together they are. So the closer they are, the less often they get separated. So the further apart they are from each other, the more places between them for the chiasma to fall. So <clears throat> essentially that's saying that if they're really close, the chiasma has to hit just at the right spot. If they're quite far, there's lots of places. If they're actually how I've drawn them that far apart, in fact, crossing over probably would separate them more often than not. And in fact, if they're really far apart, we might just say, okay, they're actually behaving as if they're unlinked. They're so far apart that the chiasma almost always hits between them. So it, they may as well be on separate chromosomes. If however, we were to draw kind of a whole nother allele and I was to draw like a C that was right close to B, then you might find, okay, even though A and B separate, C tends to stay with B. So that's important. So what we generally find is, in this case, these are not equally represented. So you're going to see more parentals than recombinants. And that would be your sign that you are looking at a link gene. So if you see this, whereby you're seeing this kind of tendency for them to stay and set combinations, then that would say, hmm, looks like they might be linked. And in fact, they might be on the same chromosome. And again, if we're seeing about equal, it's actually not, you can't necessarily say they're definitely on different chromosomes. It may be that they're just really far apart on the same chromosome. Okay, so then there's two ways you could answer this. So I think I'm just making sure I've covered all the different terminology I want to cover for you. Um, yeah, all good. Um, so again, just remember that when we're talking here about crossing over, it's, it's between the sister chromatids. I said that on the SL version, uh, but just make sure you're using your terminology correctly. So then the question becomes, how do you know? So the easiest way is to do what's called a test cross and just check. So if we look at a test cross, in this case, this parent looks like this, and this parent is all recessive. 
in which case this parent really contributes nothing. And so we can basically assume that whatever we see in the offspring is a representation of this. And so remember how we just talked about that, that the expected ratio is going to be the one to one to one to one. So that's going to be basically no difference between recombinants and parentals. So all are equal. If you do that, though, and that is not what you see, if instead you get way more of two categories, then you could start to say, hmm, it suggests that there's more parentals and which suggests that you might be looking at late. So that is one way to do it just from kind of looking at data. Uh, there's ways you can do that. You can calculate recombination frequencies and so forth. That's just kind of like good if you have a big difference. So if you're like, oh, yep, clearly there's way more, then that works. And it also only works if you're looking at a situation where you have an all recessive parent, because if both parents are crossing over and so forth, it gets really hard to tell from the offspring. So the better tool, if that's the case, so that's one option. And every now and then you'll get a nice question where it tells you that this is what you're testing. It shows you that there's obviously way more of two. And if it's a short answer question, you're just like, boom, okay, they're probably linked. If however, you're doing any other cross, so it's not a test cross, or you wanna be sure, so you're looking for kind of statistical significance, in that case, you're gonna to have to use a chi-square test. So chi-square is the better way of doing it because if we're not making a judgment call on whether it's way more or not. So let's say you got to and you expected 25 of each and you got like 32 of one, 19 of one, like when is it a big enough difference? Um, so if we wanna be really sure, then instead of just staring at it and saying, do I think it's a big enough difference, we do a chi-square test. So that would enable you to say for sure. So I am going to go through how to set up that chi-square test. Like I said, that'll be the last big thing. I will come back and just very briefly um, talk about discrete versus continuous variation, just because it could be a one random point. But otherwise, all of this kind of goes into this same concept. Okay, so again, why we're doing our uh, chi-square test is because I have two genes, and I'm curious to see are they on different chromosomes or are they on the same chromosome? Are they kind of following our Mendelian pattern that we expected or are they doing something a little bit unique? So again, gene linkage is another non-Mendelian trait. Uh, so if you were asked a question about like describe non-Mendelian patterns, this would be something that you could write on. Okay, so using chi-square, Okay, so if we're going to use chi-square, we need to be testing a null hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is always going to be the assumption that they are, in fact, uh, independently assorting. So it's going to be our Mendelian assumption. So our null is going to be genes independently assort. Another way of saying that is that they're not linked, or another way of saying that is they follow a Mendelian pattern. And then another way you can think of that is that they behave like the Punnett square would predict. So they follow the Punnett square. So essentially, if you were to do a Punnett square, they are behaving like the Punnett square predicts they would. So that's another way of saying it. The alternative hypothesis is that they are not behaving the way we expected. So they're not behaving in accordance with that. So the difference between what we expected and what we observed is too much to be just due to chance. So it appears as though the genes 
do not independently assort, independently assort and instead it appears as though they are linked. And again, if we were going one step further, we can say that means therefore that they are on the same chromosome. They're linked together on the same chromosome. Okay, so that's really important is if you're doing a problem based on this, you have to be able to establish kind of what your actual hypotheses are. Then if you were working it out, I would do a table. So here's my phenotypes. And if we are talking two genes, that means we are always looking at one, two, three, four phenotypes. And then for each of them, we are going to have our observed. What is observed is gonna to have to be given to you in the data. So this is essentially provided in the data. So that's gonna be my experimental data. So we're doing some sort of work on flies or craw or you know, plants or something where we can gather some pretty quick data. Then we need to have our expected. And our expected is gonna be how many you would expect based on the Punnett square. So this you're going to do based on the Punnett square. And that's going to give you the ratio and you're going to generally do the ratio times the number. So for example, if this was being done with a big A, little a, big B, little B times big A, little a, big B, little B data set, then, and this was my first phenotype was my dominant, dominant, then I would say, okay, it would be nine out of 16 times however many my total is. So you may also want to like calculate your total. So let's say I had 150 P's. So then it would be 9 times 16, sorry, not times 150. If this second phenotype was dominant for one and recessive for the other, this would be 3 times 16 times 150. And if this was recessive dominant, this would be 3 over 16 times 150. And if this was recessive, recessive, this would be 1 over 16 times 150. Okay? That's the trickiest part. So this is probably the hardest part, is making sure you get the expected, because you will have to do a Punnett square uh, and then apply the ratio. So again, if you memorize your ratios, that does help, because then you've not had to spend the time drawing a Punnett square. If you knew your 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, that made that a little bit quicker. Next thing you're gonna do is then for each one, do the observed minus the expected. So I just set it up in a table because it's just easier because then you just go this column by this column. Then you go observed minus expected squared. So then you take the row above it and square it. And then observed minus expected squared over expected. And potentially you can plug this into your calculator if it didn't ask you for any working. If it asked you for working, you would need to be able to show that. This number here, plus this, plus this, plus this, this final number, that is the chi-square. So that is your obtained chi-square value. So the sum of those, so if you look up on a formula sheet, it would say the sum of observed minus expected squared over expected. Uh, and this is just a way of kind of getting to it step-by-step step methodically. Okay, so that's how you would get your chi-square. So once you have your chi-square, the next thing you would need to do is compare it to the critical value. And it is possible that they'll just give you the chi-square obtained. So a lot of times the bigger test of what they wanna make sure is, do you understand null versus alternative what you're actually doing? And do you know how to actually use the chi-square value to make sense of it? To look up the critical, you can look it up in the chart. It will have to be given to you. So you do not have to calculate that. They would have to give you a chi-square chart or tell you the critical. To look it up in the chart, you need to know two things. First of all, we're going to use P equals 
95.05 unless told otherwise. Uh, so we want to use a 95% confidence or only a 5% chance we could have gotten that result by chance alone. If they tell you use P.01, that's just being even more confident. Uh, so generally speaking, we use the 0 0.05 unless told otherwise. Uh, so we're just going to use that for that uh, line in it. And then we're going to use degrees of freedom. And my degrees of freedom is always going to be the number of categories minus one. In this case, if we're doing it for a dihybrid, it's going to be four categories minus one is three. So it's worth knowing degrees of freedom more generally because you do have it come up in ecology, but in this context, it would come up as three. Uh, and the critical value for 0 0.05 degrees of freedom of three is 7.81. So most likely that would be the critical value you would be looking at if you were doing it in this context. So then the big question becomes, what? how do you compare it? So if your chi-square is greater than the critical, what that means is that there is a big difference between what you observed and what you expected. So when you subtract those numbers, it's a big number. So we're getting a big chi-square equals a big difference. So big chi-square equals a big difference between the observed and expected. Okay, so if that's much greater, then that suggests that there is actually, it's not behaving like we expected. So we would reject the null. We would accept the alternative and say that the genes are in fact linked. So big difference, reject the null. If however you get a fairly small chi-square value, it means that basically your observed and expected are pretty close together, which means that your, chi your opponent square did do a good job. So it did a good job of predicting what would happen, and the data does look like the Punnett square predicted, in which case, in this case, we're going to accept our null, and we're gonna say that the genes are independently assorting. In other words, they are on different chromosomes, or potentially so far away on the same chromosome, they're acting as if they're on different, but you can just assume that if they're independently assorting, we can say most likely that means they're on different chromosomes. So that's how you use chi-square. I know that was a bit fast. Uh, so go do some example problems, like go back to the topic uh, 10 test, I would say, and have a look at what that looks like um, on a test question and make sure you feel kind of comfortable with how that plays out in examples. Um, the hardest part about it is not necessarily the statistics, but making sure you understand what it's all about. A last little bit and piece I want to do on this is just the different types of variation. So yeah, by doing it with the topic three, I didn't kind of go back over all of the um, meiosis stuff. So hopefully that makes it a little bit shorter. And then the last part of topic 10, I will put with evolution because it's speciation related. Um, so we'll split it and put it there. Since this is already going to be epically long. Okay, so this is just a vocab thing. Um, so nothing very exciting, but just making sure I have gone over it, which is another kind of a typical pattern in genetics is discrete versus continuous variation. Um, and so here we are looking at the idea whether the trait has distinct categories or in fact whether it's actually more numerical. So if we're talking discrete, then this is generally categorical. And you can kind of, there's no in-betweens. So there's distinct categories um, and nothing falls in between. And this doesn't necessarily have to mean only one gene. It's often the case, um, but it can be more than two categories. So it can be two or more. So for instance, blood types are an example. So blood types, there are four possible 
but you can't be in between. So you are either A or B. Um, there's not any sort of in between uh, trait. So generally we see discrete when we have kind of one to kind of maybe two different genes involved. So if we look at kind of two genes like we just saw, you would possibly have four phenotypes, but you would still fit kind of neatly in a category. Um, if we're talking continuous, so in this case, often we're looking at kind of um, anywhere on a normal distribution. This can be numerical, it can still be descriptive, but often not distinct categories. Um, so basically kind of more fall and average, but you can be anywhere kind of along the extremes. So the best example is just to think of this in terms of uh, examples. So this would be things like height. So that's again an example that's numerical. So you're not tall or short. There's a large amount of variation, but skin color, which again is non-numerical, but does fall into that category, um, and or any sort of kind of a lot of different color pattern patterns show this. Um, and so this is generally the result of polygenic inheritance. So it means many genes add together to contribute to one trait. So there is not a single height gene, but if you were short on all 10 genes for height, you would be way down here. If you were tall on all 10, you'd be way up here. Most people have a combination of tall and short that puts them there in the middle. Um, and so essentially the more genes that you have, the more kind of phenotypes there would be and the kind of greater the distribution would be. There's a thing you can look up, it follows like Pascal's numbers. Um, so it basically, you can actually use, depending on how many genes that kind of creates that triangle effect, whereby every gene you add creates that many more phenotypes. Um, so I'm just gonna put a note there. I'm not gonna go into that because this has already been super long and I doubt you're gonna have like outrageous questions on that. All it's doing, Pascal's triangle, is showing this concept and probably making the point of how every gene adds quite a lot of variation. Uh, so each additional gene adds even more bigger as you go along. Um, and this is something that Mingle himself did see with uh, coloration in pea plants, or bean plants, sorry. So it's one to be careful about in terms of, we wouldn't necessarily call it non-Mendelian because it is in some of his later work, something he was able to come across as well. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially really just a terminology thing, um, being able to kind of make that link between continuous variation and polygenic traits has a big role in evolution as well um, because we can start to see things like crossing over creates new combinations and it's possible that you can have new variation arise without mutation um, because if you suddenly have an individual that gets all 10 speed genes, then they have an increased speed that had never been seen before and it's actually not the result of mutation, it's simply the result of uh, recombination and creating new combos. So this has some implications uh, for genetic variation and so forth. Uh, so it's something to know, but just kind of a straightforward term. Okay, thanks for sticking with us for this epically long one. I think it's been close to three hours, but that's everything genetics. Um, so that should be pretty good for you. <laughs>